Okay. Hi everyone, thank you for attending our virtual dental shadower session today. We want to remind you that in order to get your hours, you will have to take a short quiz. And as long as you get three out of five, you will earn your hours. The quiz link will be located in our link tree, which is in our Instagram bio. All right, let's get started. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Nuria for today's session. I am handing the mic to you. Feel free to start whenever you want. Thank you so much, uh, Shabnam. Um, so I really appreciate the invitation this afternoon. I am really happy to be here with you and to give you some insights about what residency entails and tell you a little bit more about myself. So I am Nerea Robles Leizaola. I am uh, from Mexico City. I was raised in Mexico City, but I was born in Connecticut. Uh, so this is a very small state in the Eastern uh, side of the United States. Uh, I was born in Stanford in a very small city as well, which I would like to love go visit again. Uh, and then I moved to Mexico City with my parents, all my family is from there. Um, so I was pretty much raised and educated there. So where I'm standing in that photo, it's been like 10 years since that photo was taken. And it is one of the most important archaeological sites. This is very close to Mexico City. It is called uh, Tutihuacan. So where I'm standing is in the moon pyramid and you can see this, the sun pyramid, which is the biggest one in that site. So who am I? So I graduated in 2013 from Universidad Tecnológica de México, uh, UNITEC for short. And this is located in the College of Health Sciences. And then um, I graduated from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, uh, UNAM for short, and I did a periodontics and implant dentistry specialty there. And where I'm sitting right there is a central library at my university. This is one of the places um, considered by UNESCO as one of the most important sites. Um, so this is the central library and it is made up of small tiles and it pretty much depicts the prehistorical um, stage of Mexico, the modern stage of Mexico and uh, the conquest time of Mexico. So it is a very interesting site to visit. And if you can go visit Mexico City when it's, when, when it's possible, I. I would love to have you there in Mexico City. So at the moment, I am a first year uh, resident at the periodontics residency in Ohio State University. I am about, about to be a second year resident. And in the right side photo, I am with my residents, with my co-residents. That was the very first time that we met. So as you can see, we are wearing our masks and all, and we were having a very good time. Um, that when we were meeting up. So uh, some study tips and advice on staying motivated. I think that one of the first things that I can tell you is to think about school and dental school, especially as your full-time job. Um, it is important that you, you, you feel like this is something that you have to um, work completely on. Of course, it is important to have your own life, right? Like your, your social life, your family, your friends, but uh, you have to excel at school and think about it as your full-time job. Um, try to work on homework, any assignments, project in advance. Um, as I tell my, my friends or any people that they tell me, hey, wh what do you do to you know, be more productive? Or why are you so in peace? And we are like, crazy doing homework right now. Well, I try to work in advance and I know that my future self is deeply grateful. So organization in down school is key. And I also have to do lists that have helped me a lot so that I can uh, be more organized on that. It is also important that you reach out to any student or residents in, like in my case that are enrolled in graduate programs or specialty programs. We will be super happy to give you any guidance, any help, especially 
when you are a pre dental student or a high school student, um, and if you would like to pursue dentistry, I think that it is very, very important to talk to people that are already there. That's something that I would like, that I would have liked to have when I was a high school student. So in most countries um, outside the, U the United States, you go straight from high school to dental school. So it is overwhelming when you are 18 years old. So it is very important to seek for advice. And it's important to shadow dentists in their daily practice. What I did when I was, um, when I was in, den in dental school in the first years, I had the chance to assist periodontists, orthodontists, and pediatric dentists. And I could have like different insights from these three practices in particular. Um, I would have liked to be also a pediatric dentist, but then as I started working more with periodontists, that's where I, I thought that perio was going to be something better for myself. So, um, in terms of community service, I did a one year social service at a public hospital. We primarily served pregnant women. It was a great experience um, because I, I, I learned how to treat this, these patients. It is very important that you know how to treat a pregnant woman, a pregnant woman when you, when you are a dentist. Uh, you have to, you, you, you must be as comprehensive as you can. So that to me, that was, that was a very nice experience. And I also learned the periodontal, um, how, how, to, how to treat a pregnant woman, like in, in terms of periodontics, that, that was very eye-opening for me. And in the other photo on the right side, um, what we also did when I was in dental school, and even after dental school, what we did was providing uh, that free dental exams to, to patients with diabetes mellitus and either oral cancer screening, uh, cleanings to, to these patients. And it was, it was such a beautiful thing to do for these patients. So why periodontics? So, um, when I was 23 years old, and this was eight years ago, it's been a while, um, I participated in a, a poster, a scientific poster contest in Mexico City. And this was sponsored by Dentsply and the ADA. And it was such a great opportunity for me to present the work that I was doing at the moment. So I was uh, working to determining what was the frequency of, of secondary occlusal trauma in the patients at the dental clinic in my school. And I had the great opportunity to present that work there. And then I, I, I got the first, um, the first place uh, prize. And I had the great opportunity of going to New Orleans to the ADA meeting, the ADA annual meeting and presenting this work. So, from there, I felt like my decision to go into periodontics was making a lot of sense. And as I was in, in dental school doing some period work as well, to me, it was like, I, I feel that this makes sense. I enjoy it. I, I like what I see in the clinic. Um, I was working with a periodontist at the moment. Actually, uh, the, the, the lady in the, in the center of the photo, she is my mentor. Dr. Angeles Mena, and she, she is one of the persons that I can be grateful with to, because she introduced me to this wonderful world of periodontics. So which are the common dental instruments used in periodontics? Well, I, I, there are a lot of instruments. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to put all of them in this uh, slide, but definitely the most important are these instruments that I have in this slide. So as you can see on the upper left side of your screen, uh, we have the periodontal probes. I have two different periodontal probes here, but this is pretty much an instrument that allows us to determine if there are, pocket, uh, if there are pockets around the patient's gums. And these are measured in millimeters. So every little line is a three millimeter mark. And the difference with, the, with this one, well, the millimeter mark is different. It's every 
five millimeters. And this little round ball is 0.5 millimeter. This is not as usually, I, this is not something that I usually use. I use this one uh, on a daily basis. And this in the center, this is the neighbor's probe. So this is a curved probe and it is also marked in three, in, in three millimeters. And this is a probe that we use to measure in between the roots of teeth, for example, molars and premolars for teeth that have several roots. So that's one of the most important instruments as well for diagnosis. And then in the right side, in the upper right side of your screen, you can see that there are several instruments that look alike, but these are instruments that we use to uh, do what we could um, call a deep cleaning, which it's not a term that I like using a lot, but I use it, I use it with patients but is what uh, these instruments are called scalers. So what we do uh, is uh, we use these instruments to clean and to instrument the roots that, they, that are diseased. So we have several shapes for these curettes so that we can address different areas of the teeth. There are site-specific curettes for the front teeth, uh, site-specific curettes for premolars or for the mesial distal sides, depending on which area we want to work, we have every single um, kind of curette. So it's very nice to have a ton of instruments to work with. And then in the bottom left, this is probably my favorite instrument. This is called a periotone. So we use this small instrument to start separating the root from the bone when we want to do extractions so that we do this extraction as atraumatic as possible. So as periodontists, we want to be very delicate with tissues. So this instrument is by far one of my favorites. And then in the middle, in the bottom, this is a Castro Viejo needle holder. I love it because it's a very slim instrument that we use to, uh, we, we use it to hold needles to suture. So it is, it is a very lovely instrument as well. And this one in the bottom is not exactly an instrument, but it's equipment that it's basic for implant placement. And it is um, an implant motor or engine. So we, we use this to place implants and this is a contrangle that goes attached to this so that we can place the implants in a very straightforward way. So what a typical day is like in residency. So I'm mixing photos of uh, my former residency in Mexico and my residency here in Ohio State University. But a typical day would be, for example, tomorrow. Tomorrow I have classes. I have statistics class from eight to nine, eight, eight to 8.45. And then after that I have clinic, we see patients in a morning shift, we, we would usually see patients from 8 to 11.30 or tomorrow that I have a class from 9 to 11.30. And then we have our lunch break. And after that, we continue seeing more patients from 1 o'clock to 4.30. And every day is different. That's something that I really like about periodontics, that every day is different. Um, it's very versatile that what we do. Um, one day I can be doing a ton of scaling and root planing or deep cleanings. And another day I can be doing soft tissue, um, soft tissue procedures or regeneration with bone grafts or implant placement. Um, other days that are a little bit more academical, for example, Tuesdays, we are sometimes giving uh, presentations of our own cases and it is very it is very interesting to see what other residents are doing. And we learn a ton of things from these presentations. And we have a great relationship with our professors and faculty. And every single day I learn something new. So um, every day in, in residency, it's not exactly a typical day. I, I would say it's every, every day is different and interesting. So let's, Let's start talking about, this is a very straightforward case. Um, this was a patient 
that I saw before when I was working in private practice back in Mexico. Um, it's a patient, he, he used to smoke a lot. As you can see, he has a lot of stains in his teeth. Sorry for this, it's, it's in Spanish, but it's pretty much means the before situation. As you can see, the patient has a lot of stains in his teeth. Uh, I am not showing here, uh, not showing it here, but the patient had some deep pockets, some four to five millimeter pockets and more than that. So that means that the patient had some bone loss. Um, of course, I, I tried to counsel him on, on smoking habits as much as I could. And as you can see the results, at least the clinical result is so, so much different. You can even see that the color of the gums is different. Of course, the aesthetic result is different, but the patient was motivated to stop quitting and he did. So that was one of the most valuable things for me. And of course for the patient, right? But it is, it is so, so important and so good, like how much impact you can have on patients. So this is another case of a patient with gingival enlargement and bone exostosis. So that means that the bone is a little bit thicker in some areas in the upper and lower teeth. And this patient had a 10 millimeter peritoneal pocket around this left central incisor. So imagine the bone loss was all the way to this point. Imagine how deep this instrument had to go in. So what I did, I started doing a deep cleaning in this area. Sorry about this. Uh, so I, I did a deep cleaning here and then we, we opened his gums very conservatively so that we could clean the affected root. And as you can see the result here, the situation here is much more different than here, right? What I also did when I cleaned this root, I also went ahead and did a little bit of what we call a gingivectomy um, so that we, we removed a little bit of this extra tissue. And here in the bottom, you can see that the tissues look very thick, but it is pretty much because of how the bone exostosis were, like how thick the bone was in this patient. And it was giving her a very hard time to clean between her teeth and to, to make her hygiene in general. So uh, definitely what, what we had to do here was open her gums, clean these areas, and just recontour that bone so that we can make it more homogeneous for her and much better for her to clean. And as you can see, the result here is so much more different than the initial situation here. And we were able to control these pockets as well. And the aesthetic result was something that she uh, appreciated so much. So this is, one of the cases that I saw when I was in residency, unfortunately, uh, just as a disclaimer, I cannot, I cannot um, share cases that I'm seeing at the moment at Ohio State University, but hopefully I can be able to do so in the future. So this is a very interesting case. He was a 33 year old male patient, no medical issues, no medications, healthy patient, right? And so he, he comes to our clinic and he says, well, my former dentist thinks that I should have this tooth extracted and pulled out. So I don't wanna lose it. I'm 33 years old, I'm young, and I would like to see if you guys can do something. So um, as you can see, this central incisor, um, there is a, you know, there is a space here at diastema, right? that's what we call this gaps between the, the, the teeth at diastema. And this tooth was in a different position to the adjacent teeth. So this is what we call extrusion. And the tooth was mobile. It had a mobility that was increased in a horizontal, um, in a horizontal way. And when he bite, when he, when he, when he bit, what, what happened was that his tooth kind of vibrated to every, in every contact. So that's what we call fremitus. So there was occlusal trauma in this tooth. So um, I went ahead and measured the pocket here and he used to have a 12 millimeter pocket. So what we can see in this X-ray, 
we can see a vertical defect here. So before even proceeding with orthodontics uh, or any braces, what I did first was uh, deep cleaning in this area, because if you place orthodontic appliances with all that inflammation and bleeding, the situation is going to get much worse. So something very important to, to keep in mind is that you have to stabilize the tissues, you have to reduce inflammation, you have to make sure that there, the bleeding is not present, that the, that the disease is not active, so that you can start considering orthodontics. So I did the scaling and root cleaning, and then this was followed by orthodontic appliances six months later. So that's all that we have to wait. And otherwise, if we don't wait, and if we, we do not educate the patient on how to clean, this is not going to work. So you also have to make sure that you have your patient engaged with the treatment. Then what I did, I opened this area and I went ahead and placed some bone graft and endovane. So as you can see in the, in the right side photo, you can see that I have the bone graft right here. And I have this material, which is called endogain. So this material is a gel that comes in a syringe. It is very straightforward to use. Um, and it is a regenerative material that is made out of proteins that are called amelogenins. And these have been proven to induce regeneration of bone, of periodontal ligament and cement and, and cementum. So that's something that we are looking for in regeneration. So that is, that is amazing. So um, we mixed these two materials. I placed those materials in this defect. And what we can obtain is wonderful. And it's also awesome that we can work in teams with the orthodontist so that we can achieve this wonderful result. As you can see, we, can we, we could recover the papilla here. We could close this gap. We could uh, increase the prognosis to, you could, we could improve the prognosis of this tooth that the patient and the former dentist thought that was a lost cause. So it, this is very, very rewarding. And as you can see, the bone, the bone height here is so much better. So definitely there, there is some evidence that there is some bone feel, which is important. And that's something that I, 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 I love seeing these results as a periodontist. So this is the before and this is the after situation. And this is another case in which we addressed gingival recessions. So gingival recessions are um, when, when, the, when the gums recede. So as to, so this is the simplest, um, the simplest definition. So it is when, when, the, when the margin, when the, when the gingival margin is displaced in a way that, the, that the, there's root surface is exposed. Okay, so this causes several problems, for example, hypersensitivity as the case in this patient. Um, so there can be hypersensitivity, there can be um, cavity, the, the, the teeth can be more prone to cavities. So that's something that um, we have to keep in mind. And if the patient doesn't correct his toothbrush um, way, his or her tooth, the, the way that they brush their teeth, then the situation might get even worse, okay? So uh, what we can see here is that these teeth have several recessions and these teeth have also been covered by composites. So that's pretty much resin, resin restorations here because the patient had um, hypersensitivity. So imagine to what point this, this got to, to that point that these recessions were covered with composite and that is not the best way to go. So the problem here is that this composite were invading the root surfaces. So these areas should be occupied by, by um, soft tissue by the gums. And 
the composites are invading the root surfaces. So what we did here was to, um, we, we, do, we have several techniques to cover um, roots, to, to cover exposed roots. So in this case, what I did uh, was use the canine as a center of the rotation to my flap. So I released the flap in a way that I then I can pull it down and I can cover this little graft that I took from the palate, from the roof of the mouth, okay? And then we go ahead and we, we suture, we secure this connective tissue graft with sutures, we, we, we secure it around the teeth and um, we secure it in the tissues adjacent to the teeth that are involved. And then we cover this uh, connective tissue graft with the patient's own flap that we raised. So in that way, we can get a very um, natural result after. In this procedure, I also addressed the lower premolar. And what we can see in the three week follow-up is this. So it's a little bit soon to tell, right? But you can see that these roots are, are much more covered and we can see that there is pretty much 100% coverage so far, but this is very, very, very um, soon to tell. So in the two month situation, we can see that the situation is much more stable. And this is the before and after. So even in terms of contour of the teeth, this is something that is going to help the patient clean better. Um, this is something that also helps the patient feel more comfortable because the hypersensitivity was significantly reduced. And in this way, the patient will be able to take care of his gums much more better. And in order to keep these results as is, is that you, you, you keep your patient educated on how to improve the way they clean. If they keep with their habits of brushing their teeth like this, like a violin, then things are not going to change even if you did the best surgical procedure. So I am really, really happy to have talked about this topic that I'm very passionate about. If you have any questions, please, please um, let me know and I will be happy to, to know your thoughts. Thank you. Okay, yes, uh, we do have a few questions. Sure. The first question is, what was the hardest thing to pursue dentistry in the US? I'm guessing it means what was the hardest obstacle that you had in pursuing dentistry? Right, so thank you so much for your question. Um, so as an international student, so I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of an international domestic student, but regardless, it's, I think that the hardest thing to me was the economical part, like the financial part. I was first very overwhelmed by how much these schools cost, right? And even life is, is more expensive in the United States than at least what I know in Mexico. So to me, that was the overwhelming part. But if you want to pursue what you want, things are doable, right? And if you make a plan to get to, to that goal, things are, are doable. So I think that the financial aspect was something hard for me. And um, yeah, I, I, I at first thought that, oh no, this is going to be something very, very hard to, to accomplish. I am a dentist from Mexico, like, what will people think about me? Like, I don't know if they're going to take me, but if you work hard and if you, if you let them know everything that you have done and worked for, and if you are passionate about what you want to do in life, it, it is doable. So it takes time, it takes work. Um, it is easier said than done, don't get overwhelmed. Um, it is very easy to get overwhelmed and I was there, but keep working for your goals, make a plan, that's very important. Make a plan, stick to that plan and don't let it go. So that, that, that would be my advice for this. Okay, that's amazing. Uh, 
What was something you did to make you stand out from all the other international dentists? So what I, I think that's something that helped me a lot was um, being proficient in English. I think that really helped me stand out because I did my TOEFL exam and it was okay. My, 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 my score was, was okay, but it was not what they were asking, at least in Ohio State University. They, were, they required me to have a hundred score, a hundred, a hundred point score. And I, I was like, oh my God, I got 94. I'm six points down. And then when I went to the interview, I felt that something, something helped, like in the way that I was um, talking to professors and to residents. And they, every, almost every single one of them told me, your English is very good. So I don't know if they were, were not expecting that, but I think that the way that you communicate like you don't have to have the best accent or, you know, you just have to be good at communicating. So if you're good at communicating and, you know, co communicating your ideas in a conveying way, that's something that makes you stand out from the rest. And being humble and yeah, I think, I think that those two have been like the, the two things that, I think made me stand out. Um, although there, <laughs> all the other candidates were wonderful as well. So I was thinking, well, let's see how this, this goes. And I did my best and, you know, but, but yeah, I think those, those are the things that helped me stand out. Okay, the next question is, did you ever think of choosing the international dentist program where you join the students in third and fourth year? Yeah, for sure I did. I did consider that because I was, I was looking for schools and of course the aim is to, to practice in the United States, right? So you want to have as much, as, as more options as you can. So for sure, at first I was thinking on applying to the advanced standing programs. And I, I had my, my options and I was thinking, well, I'm going to, to do the third and fourth year again, but in all honesty, I don't want to do endodontics again. And I don't want to do prostodontics again. And at that time I was about to finish my first residency. And I was like, I, don't, I just want to do perio. So after, after exploring other schools for advanced standing programs. And after exploring periodontal programs, I thought I want to do periodontics again. If I go through other three years and probably I have less, less options of states to work, but at least I know that there are options to work. So I didn't feel like I was missing on a big opportunity and I just wanted to be much better and even I, I wanted to be much better and excel on periodontics. I didn't want to, to do endo again. Like, no, in, in all honesty, I think that endo, it's like the, the worst for me. And no, that's not, it was not for me. So to me, it was like, yeah, periodontics is, is something that I want to do for life. And so let's go do those three years again. But yeah, definitely I, I thought about it. It depends on every person's plan um, and passions. So that, that was what I thought. Okay, that's amazing. Um, how did you explain or make up for the failures you faced in dental school? And how do you convince the, your interviewer your determination? Okay, so it's, it's kind of like two questions, right? So I'm, I'm going to address the first. So in terms of failures in dental school so I didn't talk about this in the in the in the talk but when I was in dental school I was like a third year dental student and I was starting with perio clinic and 
I was not doing very well because I was not completing my requirements. I was very low on period requirements. And the time for the final exam came, the period final exam, and I, I decided, well, I'm not doing well at all. I don't even have like, I have barely 50% of my requirements. So why should I take the exam? And I didn't take it. I left with one of my best friends. We both were not doing very well in Perio. And I was, I was like so fed up. Like at that moment of, of my of dental school, I was tired. Um, and I was not liking periodontics at all. I felt that I didn't learn. So of course I failed and I had to do Perio again. And in that second round, that was the eye-opening, one of the most important eye-opening situations of my life because in that second round, I learned so much and I, I was like, how, how didn't I see this in, my, in the first round? You know, how didn't I learn all these fascinating things of periodontics? And that was like my first wake up call to think about periodontics. So from that failure, out of that failure, wonderful things came. And that was, yeah, that was the, the time when I considered um, periodontics as my specialty. So, and, and there was when I met my, my, my mentor. So that was another amazing situation in my life out of failure. And can you tell me again, the second kind of like the second part of the question? Yeah. The second part of the question was how do you convince your um, interviewer of your determination? Mm, how do I convince the interviewers? Well, you, you have to be very clear on what you want. Um, you cannot be like rambling. You cannot be like going from one topic to another. You have to be very clear and very coherent. So I think that coherence is something that convinces uh, interviewers, at least in this case, you have to be coherent in what you do and in what you want. And um, what else? Yeah, be honest. Um, show that you are 100% on board and yeah, that let them know that, that you want to be there. Let them know that you are, you are a team player. Let them know that you, you are in the game. So I think those are the things that might place you in, in good standing with interviewers. Okay, um, so another viewer has asked, what was your motivation to going into dentistry in general? Dentistry in general? So this is a very interesting question because when I was in high school, I was debating between dentistry and electrical engineering. So two very different topics, right? Two very different paths. But yeah, when I, when I was a, a, a little girl, I, I wanted to be a, a pediatrician. I was not even looking at, at dentistry when I was a kid. Um, but I don't know, I, I always liked to do like things with my hands, like sewing, for example, and I like drawing as well. Um, so I, I, I really like that part of, of like doing something, something manual to, and, and then to help patients, it was something better. So that was like the perfect combo. When I, when I saw dentistry as one of my options to, to go to, um, to school, I thought, well, this could be something, something good. And I started talking to people and dentists. Um, I don't have any dentists in my family. I'm the first one. <laughs> so um, I didn't know anything from any family member, but I had, I had some friends that um, they, they, they knew Dennis and so I, I kind of talked to them and we had the, the family dentist as well. So I talked to him a little bit more about it and I thought, well, let's, let's give it a try. Um, but I think that that combination of, of being good with my hands because I, 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 was, I was okay doing things with my hands. Um, I, I, I thought, well, what, what if, we do something with this to help people. 
And I think that dentistry is a very, it's a very noble profession. Um, and yet it is, it is something that you work hard on a daily basis, but it also lets you have a life. It also lets you have a life and family and it, it gives you some flexibility. So I think that's, that's prime. And yeah, those were the decisions that led me to think about dentistry. But yeah, I was very close to go to electrical engineering school. <laughs> okay, um, so somebody else has asked, what is your most and least favorite part of being a periodontist? What's my favorite part? I think that my favorite part is that you can, you can have a very interesting impact on patients' lives from the fact that you can convince a patient to stop quitting because you opened that patient's, that patient's eyes to that reality of how bad smoking is for them. So that's, that's one of the things that I like the most about periodontics. Like even like if the patient comes to you and that patient thinks that that tooth is hopeless and you can help that patient out saving that tooth, patients are enormously grateful for it. So I think that, that the fact that you can be helping patients on a daily basis and have those, those impacts, even as, as, as little as those impacts can be, right? Like if a patient comes and, oh, I have this stain here, I don't know what it is, and we can help them remove that stain and, and just keep them motivated and keep their hygiene, that's a win. So to me, those, those impacts that we have on patients, I think that's my favorite part of being a periodontist. And also the fact that we can work on different things. We can, do, we can start from prevention and we can go to more um, complex treatments like implant placement or sinus lift, uh, sinus, maxillary sinus elevation or lift, which we didn't talk about because otherwise I would spend two hours talking about this, but we, we can do very complex treatments and um, you don't do the single thing every day. So that's something that I like about Perio a lot. Okay, that's amazing. Um, what's the least thing that you like about periodontists? That was the second part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. The least thing that I like about Perio is that like it or not, you, you, you depend on your patients. You know, you, you, your treatments depend on your patient's compliance. So if, for example, you're treating a patient to, to reduce the pockets that they have and you're doing deep cleanings and then surgeries, if those patients are not compliant or if your patient is a smoker or if your patient has a uh, systemic disease, for example, diabetes, and it is not well controlled, as much as you're doing the best that you can to do your procedures as best as you can, that treatment is not going to work 100%. So if that patient is not compliant on the way that they do their oral hygiene, that also makes your, your treatment not, not going to work 100%. So that's, that's, that's the, the, the bad thing about um, periodontics, but I wouldn't think it's like a super bad thing because it is almost my responsibility to keep patients engaged with their treatment. So it is a challenge every day and with every patient. If there are patients that are not willing to collaborate or to cooperate, then it's not a good patient for me. So as much as I can, as much as, as, as I try to keep the patient um, engaged with the treatment and motivated, you know, there, there is not much that we can do if patients are not willing to, to cooperate. But, but yeah, definitely it's a, it's a challenging thing, a challenging work every day. And that's also something that I enjoy. Okay. Um, how do you find your patients? Is it really hard to find patients in the clinic? And um, do you have to schedule them as well? In residency. So, you know, we get our patients very easily. We don't have to look for them. Fortunately, we have a front desk, two front desk ladies that are wonderful. And we get referrals every day. We get referrals from outside clinics as well as from the dental students. 
and um, yeah, we, we get we get a lot of patients. So I we, we do not have a hard time with that, which is wonderful. And um, with in my former residency, we also got a ton of patients. And we used to be 12 residents and we had plenty of patients for each of us. So, and here in, in Ohio State, we are four residents and we also have plenty of patients. We're four residents in the, four, in the first year and four in second year and three in third year. Even if we are 11, we have plenty of patients. So that's, that's a good thing. And sometimes I, I, I call my patients to, to book them. Um, but most of the times I have the front desk ladies do that for me, but it depends, depends on, on, on which case. Sometimes I, I would like to talk personally to the patients so that they can also hear my voice and hear and feel that I am close. Right. So I, I kind of do a little bit of both. Okay, great. So that was the last question. Thank you, Dr. Nuria, for taking the time to talk to us about your profession. It's truly appreciated. And I know I learned a lot from your presentation. To our viewers, remember that we will have a quiz today that will stay up for 24 hours. You can find the link in our Instagram bio. To Dr. Nuria, I want to thank you again for taking the time to talk to us and everyone else. Have a great day. Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it a lot.